Welcome to High Drama. Were these shows the greatest we've seen this time around? Well, let's start off with Michael Aguirre's The Greatest Hits Down Route 66. It is the ultimate family road trip with mother, father, obnoxious teen, and sensitive little boy. Joel Acosta, the narrator, greets us explaining that it is 1999 and Wolfman, the father, is taking his family on a road trip while listening to Carl Sandburg's song bag. Most of the music is from the early part of the 20th century, which doesn't sit too well with the eldest, who is 17 years old, but then nothing sits well with him as he can't stand anything. Mother Dearest just smiles in her optimistic way, trying to keep the peace and comfort the wee one, who has a tendency to get upset a lot. It's the last opportunity for the family to be together as they head across the country from their home in Chicago to see Wolfman's dying father and end up at the Pacific Ocean. Along the way, Wolfman is obsessed with following his itinerary and must not stray from that. To pass the time while singing and listening to familiar tunes like She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain, Blow the Man Down, and the problematic Shenandoah, stories of Woolman's father Miguel and mother are recalled. Miguel crossed the border from Mexico and met his wife in America. When Wolfman was a child, Miguel would leave his family behind. He was always hitting the road and his family. He loved to play his rickety organ and sing. In other words, Wolfman's father was a very complicated man. This show reminded me of when my older sister and immigrant parents from Germany hit Route 66 tra traveling cross country to explore America at motels and roadside attractions. Along the way, we visited my uncle in Houston, the Grand Canyon, Mount Rushmore, went horseback riding in Wyoming, and most important of all, Disneyland in California, which is just open. Almost all Americans come from somewhere else searching for a place to belong. Songs from Carl Sandburg's collection takes on different meanings and significance over the years and sensibilities, just like a family's background. Mexican, Polish, German, Jewish. But what does it all add up to in the end as we all try and fit in as Americans? The greatest hits down Route 66 made me nostalgic and sad for things and people lost along the way. At the same time, it made me appreciate the joy of singing and clapping rhythmically together and sharing stories. In this show, you see the joy and the pain of family life. A sort of epilogue gives you a peek into what happened to the family after the Route 66 trip. The band and cast were excellent. And Sarah Norris is an exceptional director. It doesn't matter whether the play is historical, scary, comedic, or dramatic. Regardless, she brings out the emotional connections among the characters and plot. There is a reason that I love the New Light Theater Company. They always find the best plays, cast, and creative team. Happy thanks. Now at Theater for a New Audience in Brooklyn is Public Obscenities, written and directed by Shayok Misha Chowdhury, and it concerns Cho Tung, who is a grad student living in L.A., who goes back to his family home. They're a Bangla-speaking family living in South Kolkata. Chokin is accompanied by his Black American boyfriend, Rahim, who will be the cameraman on Chokin's project of interviewing gay people in his area. And he's focusing on Kotis, which are the men who dress as women and live their lives that way and are an accepted part of Indian subculture. But they were not accepted by the Britain colonialists. And the phrase public obscenities comes from a 19th century British law. I couldn't quite figure out who Chilton's family members were because I missed the first scene due to subway problems. But it seems like living in the home is his aunt, Pishimoni, who still reveres the grandfather of Chopin, who died 30 years ago, and always puts sweets in front of his altar picture. Chopin has a very different relationship with that picture. 
he finds the stern look of his grandfather prohibits him from having sex or enjoying sleeping with his boyfriend in that same room. Chilton's uncle, who's married to Pishimani, uh, seems to just spend his time on the computer uh, chatting with some woman in Minnesota. The why his wife, Pishimoni, is sort of always holding it against him that he never made enough money to support her, and they have to live in her family's home. I found this play, which is like a little over three hours long, really hard to sit through. I couldn't quite understand who the people were. I never really got to care about anybody, even though the subject in itself seems interesting. It's been getting lots of raves, I guess, in the critical press, but unfortunately, I feel more like giving it a mixed face minus. Today is the last day that Brendan Hunt's The Movement You Need plays at the Soho Playhouse. I'm excited to see this show as a big fan of Ted Lasso and a Beatles fan. For fans of either of those, you may be familiar with Brendan Hunt's performance of Coach Beard in the popular Apple TV Plus series, Ted Lasso. And there is one particular scene in season three where the characters are brought together with the song Hey Jude playing in the background. It really resonated with me personally given my own relationship with my father and my parents who also are divorced. And so I'm curious to see how these themes are echoed with Brendan Hunt's show. Brendan Hunt also was raised by a single mother, much like myself. Um, and the Beatles music was constantly a source of connection for the two of them. So I'm, I'm very curious how this one man show um, will touch on those subjects and really to see how they are paralleled with my own experience. So if you're able to get over to the Soho Playhouse during this limited four-day engagement, definitely check it out. Brendan Hunt's The Movement You Need. Joe Harmon's Prayer for the French Republic focuses on a French Jewish family that has lived in France for generations, maintaining a piano store, selling and making their own Salomon pianos and doing very well for themselves until World War II. Molly from America, a distant cousin, is visiting her relatives, Marcel and Charles, and their children who are her age, Daniel and Elodie, while she is studying at a nearby school. The world is in a precarious state in 2016, with the horrifying election of Trump and the possible election of another right-wing nut in France. Things are not looking too good for Jews in France again. Daniel, to his mom, horror, goes out in public with a yarmulke on his head, which makes him a target for all the rabid anti-Semitism abounding. Their family isn't even that religious, but an old girlfriend turned the susceptible Daniel to become more orthodox. Marcel and her brother are concerned that their old father won't leave the piano store, even though there is no business anymore. He clings to it. Charles is tempted to give up their now thriving careers to move to the state for Israel, which would please Daniel no end. Elodie, who suffers from depression, couldn't care less and just wants to sleep. Molly is filled with misinformation and is pro-Palestinian, thinking of the Israelis as the aggressors occupying Palestine. All this makes for some lively conversation. Interspersed with their present-day times, we are confronted with their family from the past during World War II. Adolf and Irma miraculously are left alone to wait news of their son Lucien, who returns with Pierre. We saw the profound effect that anti-Semitism has on both time periods. The question is always, does one stay or go before it gets too dangerous to be a Jew? It doesn't matter how religious you are, or even if you don't even consider yourself a Jew as your mom was Catholic. It's all about survival through the generations. Is there anywhere a Jew can go and really be safe? As you can imagine, this play really hit home with me. I'm a first generation American and my parents had to flee Germany. Some of my relatives weren't so lucky. My family on my mother's side has dwindled to just having my son as a sole surviving generation so far. There is a part in Jewish prayers where we say a blessing for our country. Quite frankly, during the Trump years, I couldn't justify saying that prayer. I was touched to find out that they had the same prayer in France 
but for the French Republic. I also just found out that Amsterdam, they also have a prayer for the country and the queen. It is ironic that we pray for countries that will eventually kick us out, massacre us, force us to convert. The ensemble was astonishing. Tashi Kata has created a seamless set that juxtaposes at different times and locations quite marvelously. David Cromer is a skilled director bringing Joshua Harmon's thought-provoking play to life. L'chaim, Happy Face Plus. Yeah, I was really amazed at all the varieties of ways of being Jewish that the play was sort of exhibiting and all the you know, like argumentative dialogue about things. It was just so fascinating. And the performers really convinced me that they were these characters. They were all really good. And I loved the sort of juxtaposing of the two different time frames. It really gave a sense of how precarious the situation is but how unsure people are about should they go. And the idea of going to Israel as a place of safety now seems very questionable because it's probably one of the least safe places on earth, but they would um, share a commonality that they don't really have elsewhere. Um, it's a long play, but it went by so quickly because it was just so fascinating. I give it a major happy face, too. Like what I saw it off Broadway when everything, when, you know, you thought that Israel was a safe haven. I mean, Jews need a safe haven haven and now we don't even have that anymore i mean that's what upset me i mean besides all the everything else going on it was that that thought that oh my god we're never going to be safe it's horrible to be jewish because people just want us dead right i mean it's like this place this play takes place in numerous time periods i think it mainly centers itself around um events happening in 2016 in the aftermath of charlie hedbo um and a kosher supermarket attack um, but it feels as if it could have been written today. And it feels like as it follows other generations throughout their struggles, could have been written at any point in history. I particularly found the dialogue centered around um, a young person's view of Israel today to be very relevant and also disheartening. Um, and there were many, many quotes that are almost too hard to revisit um, in discussions mm -hmm. around um, language and how to criticize Israel and how that is different and distinguishes itself from criticizing and talking about other nations and how Israel always is front and center of criticism relative to other countries. Um, the one character said, for a land mass, uh, for such a small area of land mass where millions of people live, it, it garners everyone's attention. But for a, country's, for a country like India that has billions of people, um, it, people can't even name who's in charge there and, you know, all the issues that take center stage there. But yeah, no, I found that was some of the dialogue to almost be laughable because it just reminded me of discussions my peers would be having. Um, and of course it resonated with me and my family story and my Jewish identity. And I found it to be a very powerful play. And like Mark said, initially I was intimidated by the over three hour runtime, but given it's two intermissions and it's pacing, I was engrossed and it never once felt like it dragged. I was amazed at all the historical facts about, you know, the um, Crusades and their effect of massacres on Jewish people in France. And that was around the year like 1096. And then there was something else in the 1300s. It's just amazing that, you know, we've survived. And also like the fact that there's less than 1% of the French population are Jewish, but they are 40% of the victims of hate attacks. Yeah, I had no idea that France was home to one of the world's largest population of Jews and that, um, you know, regardless of the point of history, you saw that number decrease. And so to see inside the decision of one family struggling with, are they safe? And 
grappling with the realities of where they wanted to live. It's amazing how loyal Jews are to the country they're in. Like my grandfather, German grandfather, fought in World War One for Germany. And then you have his son fighting in America against Germany because they were trying to kill us. France for a long time was like the best place in Europe for Jews to be. Yeah, and the thing is, I went on all these Jewish virtual tours, and in every single one, it was the same thing. First, you're, you're not welcome, then the Jews are welcome, then a different king comes on, and the Jews are killed and kicked out. And that was every single country. Every time they ended up somewhere, first they're welcome, and then they're driven out or killed. It's like that story of the Jewish people. That's why we're wandering Jews. Eric Idle has taken the Monty Python movie, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and spiffed it up and called it Spamalot, and it's now on Broadway as a musical with music by John Dupre and Eric Idle, with the book and lyrics by Eric Idle. And it's about the King Arthur legend who runs around telling everybody he's King of England and everyone just sneers at him and, and couldn't care less. That's what England was like back then. He's trying to get people to be on his round table, and, but they don't really have a purpose until God comes down in a projection with Steve Martin's voice to tell him to get the Holy Grail. And it's like, why do we have to get a cup? Jeepers, doesn't God have any cups for goodness sake? And so he gets together a band of merry knights and they're all very silly. And as you would expect from Monty Python, and this is so beautifully cast with uh, James uh, James Monroe Inglehart as Arthur and Christopher Fitzgerald has the late lamented Matt McGrath's part with the coconuts. He plays Patsy and he's so adorable. And then you have Michael Urie who, who has a big show stopping number. You can't have a Broadway show without Jews. <laughs> I love that number. And and then there's uh, Taryn Gillum who discovers something interesting about himself. And Ethan Slander, Slater plays a whole bunch of parts. But my favorite is, I'm not dead yet. Do, 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 do. I mean, it's, it's, you can sing along the score because if you know Monty Python, you know, and also you look forward to the Monty Python bits that people who know Monty Python or know are coming. So you're giggling before it even starts. And then you're pleased with the way they pulled it off. I mean, the knights who say, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I'll let Hillary get a word in edgewise. <laughs> yes, I I want to say that I spam a lot. I loved it a lot. <laughs> it was wonderful. And I loved how they brought some of the up-to-date current things going on. Uh, when um, Lady of the Lake came on in this very slinky, tight-fitting outfit and said "Body" by Ozempic, and just the, and it was just great. And then I think in these times we need the silly, no-brainer, fun, goofy humor that that was all over this play uh, and this musical. And I just loved the fact that it was also this giant sing-along with one of the numbers uh, and everyone knows the song, always look on the bright side of life. And I just felt when I left the theater, I could look on the bright side of life. Like it just really warmed everyone's heart. Everybody needed that warmth and humor and like beautiful voices, beautiful humor. And to see these characters, these actors in these roles that were cast perfectly. I just loved it. It was my second time seeing it. I'd seen the original. Me too. And, yes. And I was very lucky to see the original because it was during a blizzard and I knew that I was going to get a ticket. So I went to the box office and got a ticket when it was sold out because people couldn't show up. So I felt privileged to see it a second time with a different set of actors and their take on it. And so it was just a pleasure to see it again. And, and to be reminded of how much fun it is to see the show. And they even had a little fun bit, which I'm not going to say, because again, it's so funny. I want you to see it. But just to let you know that because uh, James Monroe, you know, like I said, Englehart played King Arthur, but Sir Galahad was played by Nick Walker. And they're both African-Americans. And they did, had a very funny bit that sort of was a nod to them. And they had a moment that was very, very funny. Fraught and 
funny. Yes. And I also want to, yes, and that what Eva said, you have to read the program because they were the most interesting bios I've ever read and they were hilarious. So it was definitely a nod to the relationships that they have with each other, which showed a lot of fun and good humor and in lots of jest. So definitely read the program bios. They're really hilarious. It was directed and choreographed by Josh Rose. There were some great production numbers in this. Definitely. And I thought what was really interesting with this production, and, uh, and Eva, you probably know, you know, noted this as well, that there was a lot of digital uh, scenery as well as standing castles. So that was a different from the original that we're seeing this shift in how scenery and how designs are for Broadway shows. And, and I, wanted, I was just looking that up because I wanted to give a nod to it because it was very three-dimensional looking. Uh, Paul Tate Dupuis the third, he he did the scenes and the projections, and they so because he did both of them, he really had an eye to make it like like you're almost like wait wait is that real or is that projection? Exactly, I felt the same, and I also love the fact that. Uh, there were there and no spoiler alerts, but nods to other Broadway shows uh, that were subtly in there that made you chuckle. I love that because I was yeah. like, oh, that's blah, blah. And that's blah, blah. And that was really fun to to be reminded of the other other musical Broadway musical hits that they so graciously and so beautifully incorporated into Spamalot. Yeah, I mean, nothing will put a smile on your face like spam a lot. So really, truly, in these times, we need real escapism. And you can't escape better than with Monty Python and this, the craziness. So I'm giving this a beyond happy face. Me too. Tada is now doing botch with books and lyrics by John Agee and music by Daniel Fiegelstein. It's something about all New Yorkers and tourists can appreciate. Getting lost in the subway, which poor Mark just did trying to see public obscenities. We've got Russell and Sandy, who are dreading going to their aunt's house. Hugo and Madeleine are rich knobs slumming in the subways. Beezer, Schneezer, and Peg are tourists from Buffalo! Yay! They are all lost trying to find the end train. Russell and Sandy discover tap dancing mummy sisters, while Hugo and Madeleine come upon Bruce, a cheese painting artisanal rat, and his two buddies. Beezer, Schneezer, and Peg meet the titular Botch, which stands for Bureau of Turmoil, Chaos, and Headache. The boss commands her workers to cause disruptions all over the city. Will these intrepid people ever reach the end train? And who will believe all the amazing encounters they experience? I'm always amazed at the caliber of talent in these kids. It helps that Joel Sherry has constructed incredible sets, Gabriella Contreras fashioned fun costumes, and Kim Greer Martinet created lively choreography. Dazzling directed by Janine Nina Trevins. Ta-da, never botches the show. Happy face. And now for theater listings. Closing February 11th, coming after Phoenix Theater's winter rep acclaimed Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment that Mark and I both love, comes Glenn Maxwell's Drinks with Dead Poets. Amidst book confiscation and banning, a traveler is invited into a phantom tavern in Nyack, where spirits of deceased poets join the living for a drink and conversation. He resurrects iconic American authors, Poe, Frost, Ginsburg, Hart Crane, Sylvia Plath, Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, Dorothy Parker, and Emily Dickinson. Closing February 18th is Tossel's Bright House, New York play by Chris Michael, which launches New York City's oldest and longest producing LGBTQIA plus theater company's 50th anniversary season at the Flea. It's set in 1938 in the remote beach community of Cherry Grove on Fire Island, the eve of the great hurricane of 1938, an event which changes Fire Island in ways that reverberate to the present day and is directed by Igor Golden, who directed that wonderful game. 
Six highwaymen were talking bands the following evening. An intimate portrait of four artists set against the landscape of New York, a city of perpetual loss and renewal at the new Perelman Performing Arts Center. Also there, closing February 24th, is Between Two Knees, one family story of love, loss, and resilience spanning the 1890 massacre at Wounded Knee, forced re-education at Indian boarding schools, World War II, the Civil Rights Movement, Vietnam, and the American Indian Movement occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973. At Theater for the City, you have Lisa Moira's The Boy Who Listened to Painting, based on the memoir, the same name by the late visual artist and poet Dean Cosmas, which said that these closed February 18th. This also, Vich Hoyas's Good Soldier Strike and His Fortunes in the First World War, his Czech marionette puppets are doing that, and the 21st Love and Courage Gala at Theater for the City's annual benefit for its emerging playwright program honors our Penny Arcade. And closing February 23rd, you don't have to do anything, is that here. And now for a very special event. Richard Skipper celebrates 60 years of Hello, Dolly, from Carol Channing to Bette Midler and beyond, Sunday, February 11th at 7 o'clock at the Lori Beachman Theater at the West Bank Cafe. For almost 20 years, Richard Skipper has chronicled the history of Hello, Dolly, and all of the women are, a few good men, too, who played this iconic role. He even has a website, callondolly.com, which features over 1,000 interviews with the players and their first-hand accounts, and you'll want to go there and listen to these stories. Also very special is an evening with Stephanie J. Block, the mother, Thursday, February 22nd, 7.30 at 92 NY. It's an all-new show centered on the theme of motherhood and features songs by Jules Stein, Stephen Schwartz, William Finn, Dolly Parton, James Taylor, and Brandy Carlisle. Masterworks Theater Company is presenting a free public performance of Swimming in Jerusalem, a modern musical parable with book, music, and lyrics by Michael Roberts, February 11th. The musical explores the many mixed emotions and reactions among the young swimmers, both Palestinian and Jewish, giving rise to a story of joy, pain, and personal responsibility to one's history and one's future. And finally, closing February 25th, Nadia Iguana at the Signature, play calls Munich Medea at WP Theater and Second Stage Apiary. And our next show is February 24th, so have a great Valentine's Day, and we'll see you then. <laughs>